Hello, it's Scott Manley here. In the spirit of the season, I am returning to a question I was asked several months ago on Deep Space Questions. What would it take to cook a turkey via re-entry heating? Now, this is Kerbal Space Program, one of my simulators of choice, with a spacecraft that broadly resembles a turkey if you squint at it just a little. And yes, it is going through re-entry. However, Kerbal Space Program really does lack the fidelity that we would need to accurately model the temperature of a vehicle during re-entry to the Earth and the heat flows and the necessity of actually making the whole thing warm enough for long enough. Now, as many of you know, since you've been doing this recently, to properly cook a turkey, the temperature in the middle has to reach about 170 Fahrenheit or 75 Celsius. Now, we can start out by doing some simple math to figure out just how much heat it takes to get a turkey to this temperature. And, you know, normally in physics, you would look up the specific heat capacity of the substance that you're heating. But, unfortunately, in none of my engineering books seem to have the, uh, you know, the specific heat capacity of turkey. I mean, not even the brown meat or the white meat, neither of them. So I'm instead just assuming that it's a bit like water. After all, there's a lot of water in turkey. So that's about 4,200 joules per kilogram. Now, and multiply that by about 70 degrees to go from like 5 Celsius to 70 Celsius, and you get about 300 kilojoules, which is a you know reasonable amount of energy. It's about the same amount of energy that came out of the Lawrence Livermore Labs National Ignition Facility, right? Now, in terms of kinetic energy, when you're moving at about 7.5 kilometers per second, you can do half mv squared, and you get that you have about 30 megajoules in there. So you have a hundred times the amount of energy when you're in orbit in terms of the thermal energy needed to actually cook a turkey. So there is no shortage of energy available for this. The problem is, however, it, that turkey is a thick bird. And I mean that both in terms of its general dimensions and intelligence, but because it's so thick, the temperature at the surface takes a long time to propagate through by conductivity towards the interior and you need the whole thing heated to this amount so that you can actually safely consume the bird and it's a uh, you know succulent juices afterwards this means that for the average bird that's going to be cooked for a family, you're typically cooking at a few hundred Fahrenheit, couple of hundred centigrade, over several hours to make sure that the outside isn't too hot while the interior gets to sufficiently high temperature. Whereas during re-entry, re-entry events are typically over in about 15 minutes during which it is subject to pretty high temperatures. Now, I feel at this point I should give a shout out to Randall Monroe of XKCD fame, who actually did the math on aerothermodynamic cooking. In his case, it was looking at a steak. And turns out that some people actually decided to put bits of a steak in a hypersonic wind tunnel. And this is a beautiful practical demonstration that shock heating is sufficient to cook meat products. It's also the forces are sufficient to tear them apart. And unfortunately, the forces don't last for long enough to let any of the heat, heat cook into the interior. So while the exterior is burned, the interior is uncooked. It would actually make a pretty good heat shield if you think about it. Another problem we have with exposing the meat directly to the super hot airstream is it will actually spend a lot of its time in space in a vacuum, and so it will be vacuum freeze dried, and nobody wants a freeze dried turkey. They want a juicy, succulent centerpiece for their table. So you have to wrap it up in more than just foil. It needs to be something that will be sealed so that it will keep the air and, of course, the juices in. So basically, I think we have to build an oven, which is also a spaceship. So the problem we're facing is that your average spacecraft re-entry has temperatures that are too high and re-entry times that are way too short to ensure th uh, the turkey is cooked. But really, that's just because they're optimizing for protecting the occupants rather than cooking the occupants. And so I decided to attack this problem using the power of science. And I started out writing some code which would model a spacecraft during re-entry, calculate the thermal flux and the temperature of the interior. It's pretty simple. Everything is a sphere, but that's enough to say model the Vostok capsule, basically performing a re-entry of sorts. Time is on the bottom, altitude is on the left. This is a velocity versus time again. And now we get to calculate the thermal flux in watts per square centimeter on the surface, 
and the predicted temperature of the interior of the spacecraft if we didn't try to use engineering to stop that heat actually flowing into the interior of the capsule. That's the temperature in Celsius, obviously. This is the temperature in Fahrenheit. Just be glad I didn't do it in Kelvin or even Rankin. After all, a lot of these sources are from NASA. But what should be apparent is that without the ablative heat shield or the insulation, the temperature very quickly inside the capsule gets high enough to cook things. So now the trick is to keep it at roughly the right temperature for the right amount of time. So in this case of this re-entry, uh, the vehicle has a perigee of just under 100 kilometers. So it sort of falls down relatively quickly and then hits atmospheric drag and that brings it down to uh, the lower atmosphere much more quickly. But all the way through this, there is atmospheric drag going on. It's just not that critical above like 100 to 200 kilometers. There is atmosphere there, we just generally don't do very much in it. Satellites tend to orbit higher than that, and below that, they're hitting re-entry. So, yeah, this is model of the atmosphere versus altitude. And what we're looking for is an orbit that is sufficiently low down that the temperature is hot enough to cook the turkey, but the drag is low enough that it can stay there for a few hours. So these are the temperatures at specific altitudes. What we're doing is we're putting the spacecraft with the turkey inside at these specific altitudes in a circular orbit. And then we're looking at the thermal heat, you know, the heat being generated by the very tenuous atmosphere. And you'll notice that we're above 100 kilometers here, but we're below like typical uh, satellite orbits. Now I have multiple lines here because one part of the equation is the radius of curvature of the object because as you get things that are less and less curved have a larger radius of curvature the bow shock gets pushed further and further out from the surface so the actual heating gets lower and you can see that the one meter radius sphere has lower heating than the 0.1 meter radius sphere so the red band is roughly what you might consider turkey cooking temperatures. Obviously, you know, this is a fairly wide range. Some people like to do a slow cook, putting it in at 225 Fahrenheit for 12 hours so that it, you know, does its own thing. Others like to blast it early on and then let it cool down. And others like to, you know, warm it slowly and then blast it. But look... Point is, these are the ranges where, you know, you're going to need to have the spacecraft operating for hours to actually cook this bird. So a half meter radius spacecraft can start with the slow cooking at 165 kilometers. And by the time it's down about 155, it's cooking properly. And by the time it's down to about 135, it's getting a little too hot. So the next thing I did was try to figure out how long things take to decay. So we've got basically... Uh, an object in an orbit and we figure out how long it takes for its orbit to decay by one kilometer and we calculate this for different ballistic coefficients that is the amount of mass per unit area these numbers are in tons per square meter because i figure out if we've got fahrenheit involved we might as well just try some interesting new units so to get the cooking time we basically take the area under one of these for like the section in which the temperature is good. So if we say use the ballistic coefficient point to that's a 200 kilometer space, uh, sorry, 200 kilogram spacecraft with a cross section of one meter, then, uh, and we say that we're figuring out how long it takes to fall from 155,000 to 130,000, we're basically calculating this area. And that works out to be about eight hours. So clearly we need a lower ballistic coefficient if our spacecraft is going to be a half meter sphere. The section with a ballistic coefficient of 0.1 is about four hours, which I think is right on the money for the amount of time you would want to cook a turkey for. So based on those numbers, we have a spacecraft, which is about a ball one meter across, has a relatively thin skin. The entire mass is about 80 kilograms for ballistic purposes. And you can see here, for the first couple of hours, it's mainly in slow cooking mode. Then the temperature gets up a little higher. It's properly cooking. And during the last hour or so, the temperature gets up a whole lot higher. But then we have a problem. Then the temperature gets really, really high. 
So look, if we look at the altitude versus time, you can see it's got this sort of nice slow descent early on. And then as we get around uh, the 420 minute mark, it then starts to fall down relatively quickly. So it seems reasonable that if we inject our spacecraft into a 160 kilometer orbit, that it will have plenty of cooking time to make sure the bird is properly done. But we still need to figure out how to avoid it burning right at the end. Now it might be possible to do this with a regular ablative heat shield such as the Pika that is used on the uh, SpaceX Dragon, right? It's phenolic impregnated carbon ablator. And this is normally designed to decompose at the typical energies found in re-entry heating so that it protects the surface. It basically gives out this gas that protects the surface and leaves behind this char layer. Now at the temperatures required for cooking during the early part of the process, it's actually pretty stable, so it could actually just be fine. And then once it gets up to temperatures that are too hot, the ablation starts and the thermal flux through the heat shield into the oven slows down enough that you can safely keep the bird in there and, and have it be fine. The problem with this, I think, is that there's this transition from the end where you go from the high altitude to the ground. And I think that just takes too long. See, this takes over an hour from reaching like 130 kilometers to getting to the ground. And at that point, you know, you've reached your best heating temperature. You've gone through it. The turkey is still sitting in there, perhaps getting overheated. You need perhaps a way to dump that temperature or you need a way to get down to the surface more quickly. So here's a, an altitude trace where I basically set it so the area of the drag increases by a factor of 10 when it hits 130,000 kilometers. And that gets us down on the ground and moving slowly enough that we're not going to be overcooking the bird. And we could implement that using something like Lofted, this uh, inflatable heat shield that expands out and allows for greater deceleration you know, more quickly in lower density parts of the atmosphere. This would be perfect for that. And we could do that using, say, these uh, tail feather style uh, you know, deployable structures that increase the drag. Another way that you can improve or, sorry, reduce the ballistic coefficient is by dumping extra mass. And this would actually be a perfect thing to do at this time. You, maybe you have a reservoir of water that you can start blowing overboard as steam to control the temperature inside the oven and make sure the bird doesn't get overcooked. The other advantage of these high drag deorbiting systems is it helps you control where the uh, thing is going to come down. So you can actually target wherever you're having your Christmas party. It's very important if you want to deliver the turkey on time to not have to go halfway around the world to find it. Now there's another important consideration when you're cooking in space and that is the gravity or lack thereof. You might think that because we're like decelerating and generating a lot of heat, that we are actually feeling fairly high g-forces. Actually, when you're up at 130,000 kilometers, the acceleration or the deceleration is on the order of millimeters per second per second. It's tiny. And this is going to mean that the juices that naturally drop off a turkey, it's not going to happen because it will stick to it with a surface tension. Now, this means maybe you, you don't have to worry about basting it so much, which is you know good because you shouldn't be opening the oven door anyway. But maybe the turkey is going to be too juicy. Maybe it's going to have too much fat in it and you want to get rid of it. In that case, you might want to spin the turkey, put it on like a spit and spin it around really fast. That will allow some of the juices to naturally come off. And you can actually turn this on and off depending upon, you know, the state of your bird. Uh, I haven't on how unfortunately done the math on whether you can use this as a reaction wheel or control moment gyro. Your descent vehicle will also need a parachute or some other landing systems to make sure you don't debone your turkey on arrival. You, it's much better to carve it yourself. Also, given that the planet is like three quarters water, you probably want to make sure you hit land because while some people brine their turkeys, generally you do that before cooking them and not after. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.